Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, uh, late morning anyway. I should uh, note that that uh, view of user experience was not uh, what we consider the future world. That was 1967, but that was the future world for 1967. Uh, when I first joined uh, Microsoft from the academic world, I was a computer science professor, and I came here and I looked around Microsoft Research. There was a, a lot of people really impressed me, but a couple in particular uh, one you've heard from yesterday and another one you're about to hear from. And that one, that one person is uh, really impressed me, Lily Cheng. Uh, Lily came to Microsoft uh, in 1995, uh, where uh, initially she worked in the virtual worlds uh, area. And after that, she went on to uh, direct the user experience uh, team within Microsoft Windows, which is a rather big job. Uh, after that, she came back to Microsoft Research, where she led the Creative Systems Group, uh, where she did some really interesting things in our early work on social computing. Uh, she developed a, a really interesting Xbox game called Kodo, which was to teach actually programming concepts to, to kids. It's very fascinating work. Uh, prior to coming to Microsoft, she was actually at Apple Computer, where she led a lot of the work on, on user experience. Lily's also a registered architect, and she's worked in Los Angeles and London. Uh, and now uh, she's, she's here back in Microsoft Research, or she's been there for a while, but now she runs something called the uh, Fuse Lab, which is our real focused activity on social computing. Lily always, uh, whenever I hear her talk, she, it's always a delight because she opens my eyes to a lot of the possibilities of social computing and has had a, quite an impact on a lot of our products. So Lily, welcome. Thank you. Hi everybody, thanks for coming. Um, so my task today is to talk to you about the future of social. And if anybody out there uh, knows what Facebook is and Twitter, um, it's a pretty daunting task to, uh, to reinvent future because in some sense I think the things that we've seen over the last 10 years um, we never ever could have predicted. And I thought I would take you back a little bit through my history um, at Microsoft. So I came here from Apple in 1995 and we had this vision that social um, on the computer would be just much richer and kind of a lot more fun and whimsical than it was back in 1995. Now you have to remember back in 1995, um, most people didn't even use the internet and a lot of people weren't using email. So at the time, this was pretty crazy. Um, so we had um, these three projects which we released. One was called Comic Chat. Um, when you talked on the computer, you would basically generate a comic book. And we worked with a comic artist named Jim Woodring to kind of help us program the different frames that you would make as you would talk and your little character would gesture. And then we created this other system where people could create their own rich worlds and interact with them. And one of the reasons that I'm talking to you about this today is this really isn't um, the future that happened, um, as you all know. Um, really, this is the future um, that happened if you were looking out 10 years from 1995 or more than 10 years. Um, this is really what we have today. And I think we never ever would have predicted, you know, in 1995 that the way you would be representing yourself is with a little bitmap that's, you know, this big that has your name on it. Um, and we would really be talking in text and, um, you know, and having little status messages. This is from my friend Elizabeth Theory, and you know, she said boom shaka today, and I had to like that because I, I knew what she meant. But um, you know, I think we would have thought, well, this just isn't imaginative enough. And often when I talk about social to many people who had that early vision, um, they say, well, isn't that kind of silly, somebody saying boom shaka to you in the morning? And it is a little bit silly. But I try to remind people that just like if someone was to look at your email inbox, they might think it's kind of silly boring, not interesting, but it might be the most interesting, impactful um, bit of social information that you look at every day. Um, and so those of you who use Facebook or Twitter, um, 
if your friends are really in there and they're people that you like to communicate, in a sense, this has been um, the future of computing, looking back from 1995. So I pulled up some of our old work also, kind of going back to the center, because we stopped doing virtual worlds um, when we saw this new thing come out called instant messaging at the time. And we just were really interested, really, in focusing back on the basics of people. So we went to a mall, um, and we had people draw maps like this. And so what that is, typically, is that people would put themselves somewhere important, like in the middle, and they would draw in about 30 seconds the people that they cared about. Important people stood out, and people almost always clustered people into groups. That group there um, with the CGPM that you might not be able to see, those, those are really important close friends who exist in multiple groups. But people don't do this. I mean, we've found over and over, if you look at your contact list on your phone, if you look at your inbox, your contacts, um, people, um, generally don't organize their friends into groups because groups change over time very quickly. So your most important friends tend to sit in multiple groups. And over time, people tend not to maintain these lists. So we thought, what if we could kind of represent this just by watching what you do? So we built this little prototype um, let's see, uh, called the personal map, which is here. Um, and what this does is this, um, this just looks at my email. It looks at who I mail frequently and who I mail in groups, um, who I CC on messages. So this is my research team. So someone that I interact with frequently actually exists in multiple groups. And again, this is just mining my email data. I don't really have to do anything, but I might want to tweak or edit it a little bit. And this is really a concept that underlies a lot of our research that we've done over the years and we think is really going to continue, that your implicit actions, maybe just emailing people as you CC them on messages, as you talk to them, um, that indicates who you care about and who's grouped together. All right, so I'm going to close out of that and go back to PowerPoint. Um, so we took these maps, and we, and we actually did a lot of research to see if they were accurate. And then we thought, again, you can tell this is really old because of the because of the look of the UI, we thought, well, maybe we should just completely redesign email, because gosh, that email gives us a lot of heartburn every day. So what this did is it took that little list, and obviously you don't want these big visualizations everywhere, but it just listed this dynamic list of the people that were most important to you, and when you clicked on people or groups of people, it would give you like a, all the conversations and sort of nuggets. And then maybe as you type a new message, all those related people would just show up. So we thought about how you could use that data, your data of who you care about, kind of infused across the system for you when you need it. Sometimes really minimally, like here, just a small little list of names, you know, and at other times in richer visualizations. Um, one of the things that we did about two years ago is we actually went back and said, hey, you know that project that we did um, redesigning email? Let's go back and rethink that again. So we actually did a project where we took um, the personal map project that you saw here, and we actually ran it over desktop search and all your communications that are coming into your system, as well as some external information, and tried to cluster all your messages for you as they come in and also tag them for you. So those of you who use email, which is probably everybody, most people don't always file stuff in folders because that's tedious. Um, and you just want important things to pop out and maybe less important things to recede. And one of the most important, um, interesting features that people really loved with this was what we called the periphery. So it just took all your messages from people and things that you never respond to, summarized it for you, and sent it back to you in a really beautiful overview so you could really quickly skim, like you might your social network, stuff that, um, that you that you don't want to respond to, but you still want to get a, but a quick glimpse of. Um, so we took that, and we kind of um, went into email a little bit more. Um, and we thought, well, emails, email feels so segmented from the rest of the world, in a sense. I've got like all my social data out here in the web, and then this personal feed of information coming into me. So what if I could sort of infuse relevant social data around people that I'm talking to, just right there you know, in my email client as I'm talking? So we did this little experiment. One of the things that we were really focused on is how to bring all the lessons of social software and sort of the, the energy and the passion and the interest that people have into your everyday work tools. And we just found emotionally for a lot of people, email kind of gave people anxiety, whereas you know, Facebook doesn't necessarily give you anxiety. It might give you a headache, but you know, generally it's, it's, um, it's where you go maybe to relax or have fun. It's not work-critical information. 
And so we built this little tool, and what you see here is for every single person that emails you, we would show their picture. Um, Andre, for some reason, was dressed as a cowboy, so there were some work-appropriate problems there, but you know that was his choice. And then everybody else on the thread, and as you clicked on people, you would do queries about them that sort of spanned a lot of different sources, and you would get information about people um, just as you email them, while you email them. You really didn't have to do anything. It just sort of worked for you. And in the, at work, just like you guys in your universities, and we have a lot of um, company-specific data that you might surface that's useful for people that you work with. Um, and for close colleagues, obviously, you have a lot of information. So we ran this here at Microsoft and also a few other companies. And um, we found a few things. Because we were really interested in, um, can we use the social information just to give people more awareness of the people and things that they care about while they're actually doing productive work? And we found that most people really explored people they didn't know. We knew who you emailed, so we knew um, whether or not people were familiar or not to you. And probably one of the most interesting things we found was that we did a pre and a post survey after using this um, prototype for a month. And we found at first people really thought that they were going to look at their managers, people that were important to them in the organizational hierarchy. And after a month, um, that kind of evened out. So your coworkers' friends were as important as your managers. And I think this is just really critical to think about when you think about social. It is social. And people, um, you know, hierarchy obviously doesn't always matter when you, when you want inter to interact and communicate with the people that you care about. Um, we also do this kind of crazy thing. Um, we instrument all the prototypes we do, and we sort of look as we roll them out to see who's unexpected that's using them, at least within a company. And obviously, um, this would be a lot harder to do for the whole world. So this was an org chart of all of Microsoft. Bill Gates was still here at the time. And you can see, like, you know, Craig, um, Craig Mundy is just this tiny little square, you know, and this is Microsoft Research. We're not really very big compared to um, the rest of the company. but. Um, but what we could see is who's using it. And we would go to groups that were using this in unexpected ways and really trying to understand how they were using this. Um, one of the things that's really been um, interesting for me being at Microsoft is we've kind of, we have this whole product division. And so the Outlook team saw this and they said, this is super cool. We want to ship it. Um, and so we went along that journey. And as um, Dennis was saying, sometimes we do this. Um, like, I've actually gone to the Windows team, which was pretty intense, and actually shipped a giant product. But we also work from research and sort of hand our research off and um, have product teams build it. And um, this was really interesting, too, for us. Um, Michael did this diagram, which just basically gave me a giant headache. This is the privacy flow that the Outlook team had to use. Because when it's a product, it's not a research project. You really have to go through all the details of, of privacy. And um, I'm not, definitely not going to go through this. But I think one of the interesting to, things to think about is the Outlook Social Connector lets you connect to Facebook and Twitter and start bringing your friends' information into email as you communicate or your network. And one of the things that they found when they worked with um, LinkedIn and I think it was Facebook and Twitter, both of them, they really had no secure way of um, giving us back your email address. So that was something that you could actually do through the API. You could um, access people's data. And some of it was private data. So the social networks were actually great. They were like, this is really cool. We really do want to think about how our data can flow into work and be reused. But we want to. We couldn't use it unless um, they added a lot more privacy controls, encryption, and things like that into some of the types of data that we were getting back. And so I think this is really important because um, social data, as you guys have seen, flows into social networks and out of social networks. And I think as we flow information around, um, when we start thinking about different uses, in this case, work use, using um, use that often people thought of initially as social, um, we probably need to reauthor the tools um, and the data constraints so that they are secure and um, meet privacy constraints. And that's a really a huge amount of work, and it's really complicated to get right. Of course, there's also the social part. Um, so Michael said that when he launched this, um, the official version within the company, he got a mail from like, you know, the head of finance or legal or something, whose boss is Steve Ballmer, who said, you know, should I really be getting messages like, like this from my boss at work. And so I think um, one of the things that we also have to figure out is just socially what's appropriate, what's appropriate to see in different places, and how do we make sure um, that people feel comfortable with this data as it flows around. Um, 
because otherwise they won't use the tools. And one unique thing I think about social software, which is really different than other kinds of research, is you don't really know if it's going to work until you launch and deploy it. And so that requires some really unique skills from people who build social software. First of all, it brings your, it, your research becomes much more applied because people actually have to use it. And in order to use it, it actually has to work and be reliable and um, useful to them, I think. And, um, and it just has been really fascinating for us to think about how we build, deploy, release, build tools for social software in the context of research. Um, so anyway, we did another project. So that's sort of um, a series of, of projects that we've done over time around um, social moving into a place where it isn't today, which is you know, really about getting work done. I mean, I think it has been used for you know, open source and coding and things like that. For most people, I think um, social software feels really different from their everyday jobs. If you talk to teachers or you know, um, folks like that, they're, they're using really different tools sometimes to get work done and then you know, interact with their friends and, and get news. So, um, so we're really interested in the public social data feeds. And there was, this is another story, and this kind of segue into another place, uh, topic that's pretty hot, which is social in search. And so there was a guy in my group, one guy, and he said, you know, I'm really interested in Twitter data. This is about a year and a half ago, and Windows Azure, and I just want to build a little prototype. I was actually trying to get him to stop working on another project, so I thought, that's great. Go for it. And so he started building this little project. and. Um, he started looking, we called it TWIG because we were interested in building a dig-like system. So mining all the things that people shared in Twitter, the URLs, and watching how they virally spread throughout the system to sort of predict what would be popular or funny um, before it happened, or before it became widespread. And so we started building this project, and I think a week after we started, we talked to the Bing team, and we had showed them, and they said, this is awesome. We want to ship this. And three weeks after he started literally doing his Hello World Azure, I'm going to play with Twitter data, we shipped this on Bing, which is pretty fast and kind of terrified us, but completely excited us at the same time. Um, so if that terrified us, I remember Steve came into my office about a week later with a big grin on his face. And he said, um, I think we're getting the fire hose. And I was like, who's, who's we? You mean Microsoft? And he's like, no, we, our little project of we added a person. So it was two people are going to get the um, Twitter fire hose. Um, and we're going to process all that data. And we're going to ship it in Bing in like a month or two. And I was like, OK. So, uh, so we started this project. And I think three week, three, about three months later, we actually shipped at Web 2.0 um, this whole back end for processing all the real-time data um, on Twitter. And um, that was really challenging. Um, we had estimated how much data it would be. It was 20 times the data that we thought it was going to be. It was about 12 million updates a day. Um, we had massive growth at that time. Twitter was just growing in some insane way. And the reason Bing really wanted us to use this system was, is there's a user scenario here. I tweet. I want to see my twi tweet on the page. And so your latency has to be seconds. Um, to, to process all the information, get it through the system, and, and, and show it on the page. And we had optimized the design of our back end really for um, to, to be real time, not real time in a computer science sort of way, but real time for an end user, or near enough to real time. Um, later that year, um, I would say by a year and a half later, from August to October, um, that 12 million updates increased to about 500, 500 million updates a day, which was really intense because we also got a bunch of Facebook data. And so for us, um, the back end and how we build these systems is really important. And what was so great about us being able to build this from research is we could build it in a way that would let researchers and other people around the company, like us, who do experiments on this data, actually be able to experiment the data. Because we knew that just getting the data in, um, pulling out, doing like natural language detection and link expansion and you know, evil, bad content discovery were things that we had to do just to ship. But we felt like this data was so rich, and we didn't even really know how to tap into it. Um, so that, for us, was just, is just an awesome story um, that we were able to you know, help. Obviously, the Bing team did a huge amount of work. But just um, two guys for a couple months were kind of able to build this whole system and then have it go out to like gazillions of people um, and give us access to what we think is just really an amazing thing. Um, 
of course, there is the question now that you have this amazing thing, like what do you do with it, right? What do you do with the data? So first we started doing a bunch of analytics on top of it. We have a, a product at Microsoft called Fast. Um, it does a lot of um, natural language detection. It determines um, grammar, it does entity extraction and things like that. So we actually took the Fast engine and put it over the data and started processing it to see um, what kind of information could we get out of kind of all the aggregated data. Um, we also put in all our own custom filters. So for Twitter data, it would be things like, show me people with more than 500 followers. You know, for Facebook data, is, is it a fan page? Um, are these people retweeted a lot? Things like that, that were sort of custom to the data. Um, we also started doing tons of visualizations. So we were just look interested, because our first idea was how does, how does information spread, and looking at, OK, in this case, this person tweeted something, but it got you know, a few layers out before it actually got retweeted and sort of um, spread and really took off through the system. And then we started doing things like just taking um, search terms and determining um, subtopics and really looking for, you know, where and what around what topics and when do things take off. So this is a query of Microsoft where we were looking at, you know, how many tweets there were and there's this huge spike. You know, what was that spike about? And in this case, if you drill into it, you see this spike really came um, during Haiti and Microsoft gave a lot of money um, and did a lot of um, sort of humanitarian work around that. And there was just this huge response on Twitter around that work. Um, but sometimes you don't really know what your audience is interested in. And I think sometimes these tools can really help. So we have a lot of work that we're doing and that we're trying to do around data visualization analytics. But one thing that I think, um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are doing that kind of research, that you should think about this data is um, just creating kind of these views or these dashboards of information isn't always that interesting to people. Sometimes they're really hard to read, and sometimes people um, don't care that much about the summaries. So one of the things that we've been really looking into is we've been building just a huge variety of applications. Um, so these are some things have shipped um, and being, I'm not going to go through all these, but I'll show you a few of them, of just what are some interesting things that you might do um, with all this social data. And I would really, if you guys have ideas or thoughts, um, it would really be great to have a, a discussion around this, because I really think this is the future. It is not that you have access to the data and that you can process it and you can do all these analytics, but you know, what kind of experiences are we making that's going to make um, communication and just knowledge you know, better for people. Um, so this is you know, where we started with social search. It's pretty simple. Um, social search, kind of generic, but just the fact that we got that up in a few months was really um, exciting for us. Um, we went through a bunch of different versions with those guys. And after we did that, we thought, well, if I go back, you know, um, trending topics aren't really that interesting to me. I don't know what half of them are typically if you go to Twitter. And I don't care about a lot of this stuff. Um, I learned who Justin Bieber was. You all know who he is now. But, um, you know, I don't know. Did it really enrich my life? I'm not sure all this work was worth just finding out who Justin Bieber is. Um, so we started to build other things, like could we do this same thing, mining your personal feeds and combining it with the public feeds? So we did a project called Spindex, which you can actually go out and try, um, which takes your feeds, um, queries over them to find interesting web news, and then gives you like your trending topics for your network. And for me, this is a really useful tool um, because I have a lot of people that I follow, and I don't always track what they're doing, um, and I would like to. And if I could kind of have that summarized for me, it just helps me know what's hot or what's important and what's trending today. Um, so I think those kind of merging your personal feeds, mining it, and then giving you some other news and summarizing that for you. I think that's just going to be a huge topic. You're going to see more and more of these kinds of projects um, come out. Another project, and I'll give you a little demo of this, is just is called Montage. And uh, I'll just show you this one. Um, Montage is a project that we made because we thought that the way we were sort of visualizing all this data on Bing could be cooler. And so we thought, wouldn't it be cool um, well, actually, we were really impressed by the Huffington Post and these news sites, which literally in about 10 minutes after some natural disaster or some internet news, they have a page up there, which can often become like the, the page that everybody goes to for news. So in our case, there was a shooting, the Fort Hood shooting. You know, the Huffington Post popped a page up there. Um, 
pulled in Twitter and you know news and other things like that and, and it was the source that you would go to to look for news and we thought wouldn't it be cool if our own MSN editors could have a tool that would let them post a page in about five minutes and then we thought well there aren't really that many MSN editors in the world wouldn't it be great if everybody could do that so we made this tool um, basically you just type in a word like I could type in Tahrir for some reason I'm having internet slowness so I pre-baked it um, so it, it'll pop up a page in a second and you get kind of this immediately you get this page which assembles all this um, web info and I can kind of um, toggle through different templates. Um, I might decide I want to keep this one and I might come in here and I'm going to say, uh, you know, I want this to be about, you know, Egypt instead of Tahrir Square and I can, you know, well, I'm going to make a lousy page, but I could say, you know, save that and it, um, it updates those pictures and I can actually come in and I can say, like I said, I'm having some connectivity issues. I can also change the type. So if I want this to be news instead of images, um, I can also search for that and get news. So it kind of lets people, literally in about a minute, um, author a page around real-time news and share it out with their friends. And I can either pin content or I can just leave it, um, in which case it's a dynamic feed. Um, usually it works. I don't know. Um, and anyway, so, so you can um, come in and you can share all these out with your friends. You can publish these pages. And we've made this tool available really to anybody who wants to use it. And um, we just have a ton of people creating really cool content about all kinds of things. Um, this was a pretty neat site that came out. Um, it actually started when there was a snowstorm in Seattle and there really wasn't a good source for traffic. So somebody made a montage um, and it just said, you know, this is the traffic news, the ferry news, the, the TV news. And this really became the best site for Seattle traffic around the snowstorm. And actually the TV station started pointing people to this page because they thought it was better real-time updates on, you know, where to go and routes to find. And then they had, and then we had like other people doing really creative things, like somebody made a little page um, for Fleet Foxes, which is a local band. And it's just, you, you can imagine this on a tablet, but um, you know, this is something that's still really hard for normal, average people to do on the web, probably most of us, too, and post and build um, in a really short amount of time. So one of the things that we're really passionate about in our team is how can we take all this real-time rich data and make it really easy for people to author things about the topics that they're interested in um, and share those out and, um, you know, and not even think about it as something difficult, novel, or hard. Um, we've done the same thing for a bunch of companies and um, maybe I'll switch back to Harvard's Company Crowd is something that we just released. And um, we've done basically montages with indexes behind them so you can search over them and find trends for you know, pretty much every large company out there. We just thought we would start with a set and see if we can actually make kind of this real-time authoring of data um, useful and impactful for um, companies. So we're looking at, you could imagine elections or really any, any vertical authoring a set of content around those. Um, so I'll just walk through some screens of that. Um, so like I said, we have these companies. You click into a company, and we sort of dynamically build this page of companies. In the case of companies, um, we don't just use the regular Twitter feed. We actually mine the feed for um, authoritative people who are tweeting. Otherwise, you tend to get a lot of garbage if you just search for the word um, and, and give a little more um, filtered view of the Twitter feed. And these are just some different examples. We tried big companies. We've also done things with Cooney um, and the Sesame Workshop. Um, and then what we do is we actually let people, this is Microsoft's page, we actually let people go in and crowdsource or edit the sources. So for a lot of these topics, these companies, they don't actually get a lot of news on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and there isn't even that much news news about them. But that maybe the search engines pick up, but there are a lot of bloggers or people who tweet about them, so we let people add in sources that are added dynamically to the index, um, and then you can, um, you can add those in and you can see the history of everybody who's authored or added that. So think, you know, Wikipedia um, in its early days for authoring, group authoring pages around topics. So anyway, this is an experiment, and we have you know, other experiments like this too, and you can also just go and create a page on Company Crowd um, and check that out. Um, so one of the things that we've done, as I've shown you a lot of stuff, is one of the things that we do in our team, like I said, it's really hard. I mean, it's hard for a researcher to build a whole back end and then know enough about UI, <laughs> build UI for their thing, get all the data in, release this, manage the community, 
and uh, you know, and not spend 10 years just trying to learn all that stuff. So one of the things that we've been trying to do in the company, and it'd be really great to get your feedback to see if these kind of tools would be interesting to people, is um, we've been trying to just make a little toolkit for making the kind of apps that we make or services. So you sort of can analyze some data, bring it in, and then kind of author it and tweak it in different ways. And just, just because it's been so challenging for us in a sense, um, we thought you know now that we have a lot of knowledge in this, it'd be really cool over time to share this. So this isn't anything that we're, the tools are just ideas that we have in the future of how to make it um, more easy for more people to author um, you know, these kind of apps. Um, so I have some you know, future of social thoughts that I thought I would throw out there, and then I would really love it to get your feedback on, you know, how you guys use this stuff and what you think. But I think that um, social, in some sense, is already everywhere. Um, I can't drive to work without hearing on the radio that, you know, I should join some, at follow somebody or follow somebody on their Facebook page. I mean, it's just all over, all around us, and it really has transformed the way people communicate, um, probably because the web connects people, and if you're designing a system for the web, you can't build it without social. Um, but one of the things that I talked about with the personal map in the beginning is that, you know, if you remember that map that we made of your email interactions, I do think that your implicit actions today aren't really captured in social networks. Um, most of it are kind of explicit things that you're doing. And one of the things that we see, um, your implicit actions increasingly sort of becoming part of your online identity. And those are sometimes good and sometimes bad. So for example, um, you know, you work in a place, they know information about you and your colleagues, what parts of that information could just be shared and would enrich your profile and what parts would be creepy and weird. But how do we start giving people access to their information um, and making it useful? One of the things that we've been just looking at is search history and sharing that around the team, um, knowing what other people in my group are looking for and have found saves me a lot of time. Um, you know, same thing with all of your experiences. So I think it'd be interesting to think about what implicit actions could either help you as an individual. So obviously, I should have access and be able to use my own email history better than I use it today just within email, but then how might sharing parts of that really help in social? Um, the other thing, and this is more from the second story that I told you, uh, Facebook and Twitter, I mean, there's so much data out there, and it's, it's not going to stop. Like, there's just massive, <laughs> massive amounts of data out there that are sort of being gathered and collected. Um, and I just think, you know, I can't imagine anybody doing research in the next five years that isn't going to use these data sources and, um, and want access to more. And, um, you know, we've already been seen um, a lot of this starting to be used for evil, by organized crime and stuff like that. But just how is it going to be used and what's our responsibility as a research community to really you know, think forward about those uses and try to predict things. So one simple thing that I talked about was all your social networking data might be available in work, and maybe we need to have new privacy constraints and things like that, or um, encryption around data. You know, you know, what are other things that are going to happen if we can get out ahead of that? Um, you know, I think we can really have a huge impact. And then just you know, with Montage, the tool that I showed you where you can type in a word and you're authoring a page. You know, think today how people author content. I mean, often. Um, either you start with a web search or a Wikipedia page, students, or we give them a blank page. You know, you give them a blank piece of paper and say, have at it. You know, and I just think the way we research and teach everything isn't going to start so much with a blank page. It's going to start with content that people are filtering and narrowing down. But I really think that um, everything we do in the future is going to start with kind of this pulse of what are people saying, what are they doing. Um, and a lot of that, you know, if you just think of the research process and how we write papers and do research and review papers and get the word out. I mean, I really think that um, you know, we should think about that. And you know, are we um, getting the findings out in a way that really impacts the most number of people um, in a timely way? So I would just say you know, the future is here. If you talk to 12-year-olds or 15-year-olds, you, know, you will see it. And, um, in some ways, and I think you know, so many of the tools out there um, give you a little glimmer of how work and play and you know interaction will be doing in the future. Um, I see that a lot just because my area is, is 
you know, is social computing, so all my friends are there and everything they do is public. Not everything, but a lot. But I just think, you know, I would encourage you if you're not using these systems to really use them so that you can kind of intuit how it's going to impact, you know, life for the younger generation. But um, that's kind of the end of my talk. I don't know if you guys have um, questions or comments or, you know, can, the crowd can answer things too, because I know there's a lot of people in here who um, are also experts in social. But um, we'd just love to hear what you guys think. Thank you. Yeah? Yes. And, and particularly when you sign up for LinkedIn, there's a fairly, when you sign up for LinkedIn, there, there's some troubling fine print there. I think in all of them there's troubling fine print. And I think another trouble is the space is moving so quickly that the social norms are really changing really quickly too. And also what companies want to do changes pretty quickly. Um, but, I, but I mean, when you, you know, LinkedIn owns those data that you've submitted. They're not yours. Right. And, and therefore, it's their choice as to who. I think one of the things that we've seen is that increasingly companies are under pressure to, to let you take your data, <laughs> imagine that, and um, take it somewhere else or store it for yourself at least. Um, I think you're going to see more of that. And I think, I think companies will begin to self-regulate more. But I do think. Um, what users expect or want um, really differs for different people. And so just it's challenging. I mean, I, I don't think that um, in a sense like Twitter would not have happened if their defaults had been private. The fact that Twitter became really the place where you go for breaking news and it's really useful um, was because of their defaults. And I think a lot of companies had, and, and so you know if you go to Twitter that by default most people are being very public with their data. And other systems, like if they did that with email, there would just be a disaster. So like with my project that we did where we showed you your feed in email, I got some emails from people that said, you know, I love this project, but I think you just made all of my email public to the company, which wasn't the case at all because I would, I would we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but people are just really unsure what's public and what's private and how their information is being reused. Um, so I think it's a challenge for companies. I, I don't know. Are you asking me what I think we should do about that? Well, I guess the question, I mean, you have the same problem with email. Right. Is if, if someone with administrative privileges, you know, for example, with the climate gate stuff in England, if someone with with administrative privileges decides to release that information. Uh, it, is there a way to get around that problem? Well, I think uh, um, Murdoch's having a little bit of that issue yeah. today. <laughs> I think we're going to see that evolve. I mean, just remember, most of this stuff is new. Uh, three years ago, people really couldn't get access to any information. Like, there are a million Twitter apps today. Uh, I think they just announced that earlier this week. You know, a few years ago, there were none. <laughs> and so how people reuse this data and how useful it is for people, I think, is something that we should just really watch. Um, and I think it's hard to predict. But I do think people will be outraged if their data is misused. And I think companies, you know, you're starting to see them respond. Bill? So there's this great line from Melvin Kranzberg that says, uh, it's his first law, that says technology is not good, it's not bad, but nor is it neutral. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that, actually, a second law is that, that inventions some other necessity. And this is a good example of a second law as well. And it seems to me, it, I just comment on given the concerns that were just articulated, mm -hmm. do, do you see that there was, there's as much obligation on the design of such systems that not only do they look good and are they usable and that sort of stuff, 
but they make it absolutely clear by their very affordances and design what is in fact visible to whom and what's not. I think so, and I think it's, a, it's probably one of the hardest design challenges. Yeah, and that's, it's actually it's a neglected one, and, 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 and I, I suspect both of, neither of us know even where to start, but I guess the place to start is to recognize that it's part of the design brief. It has to be going forward, especially with these technologies. And I think it's also, you know, I think people will get a little bit better. Right now, most of these systems are query-based. So it's like, like in the case of email, um, when I click on you, I can see the information that I have access to about you. So I work at Microsoft, so I can see your Microsoft information. You know, you might be my friend on Facebook, so I can see that information, and I can see information that I have access to. But um, people just who use the system, this was this challenge where people, people, of course, if it's you, you can see everything about you in our system. We thought we had designed it really clearly that you were looking at the information that you have access to. And people knew that. They totally understood it for other people. But when they saw themselves, they were like, ah, I can see all my information. And they just weren't sure what everybody else could see. But of course, what everybody else can see is slightly different based on who they are. And so I think it's just a super interesting and challenging um, design problem because most of the UIs, I think if you design them right, give you know, you don't have to like keep switching knobs to see the information that you have access to, but how you know what different types of people can see in different contexts um, is, is challenging to communicate clearly and simply. In the spirit of starting with quotes, there is the, you know, <laughs> what goes on in Vegas stays, stays in Vegas. Um, my question is, is about really, do, do we know what we've created um, in this environment um, in terms of the personal privacy, in terms of building on what's been said before? Um, I just shared my search history <coughs> with my colleague um, and there were things in it that um, I had to explain. Um, I <laughs> Share with us. No, I'm if, kidding. <laughs> it was the Beanie Baby price guide. I thought I had a valuable Beanie Baby and there's lots of scholarly stuff, but let's not go into that. Um, there was um, also um, things like iPhone data and mapping data. The first thing my wife said is, just when did you go to the Isle of Wight and who was it with when we put all the data up on a map? And, but I go back, apart from my personal confessional, do we actually, are there people studying? Are there people trying to understand perhaps the today unforeseen consequences? Do we really know what we've created here? Do we understand what the impacts will be? Do we understand about that differentiation between work, between public, between private, and the spaces that people have? And obviously anthropologists have studied this over time in a variety of different circles. Have people begun to do that sort of work in this field to understand those that differentiation in order to understand how to present it in a UI? I mean, I think Jonathan Gruden, you guys might know Jonathan, was probably one of the first researchers. He did this for email and instant messaging, because this isn't necessarily a new problem. I think when um, email first came into the workforce, people thought, oh my god, this they, they literally did. This is like this distractor, this crazy thing that's coming into the workplace. Um, and they've also, we, we also share like calendar information and things like that. Um, and one of the things I think that people have found is that changing privacy settings should not be retroactive. So for example, um, let's say today my calendar, where I'm going and who I'm meeting with at Microsoft is private to me, unless I choose to share it. But public company is, you can see that I'm free or busy. And that's just, you come to Microsoft if you work here, that's just the way it is, and you know that. But at Boeing, I think they changed that setting they decided it's much better if everybody at work knows where you are. So you can know what meeting you're in or what you're doing. And, and that's fine if you come in knowing that. If, you, if I today knew that uh, I started for a new company and our company data is public, uh, where I'm going and who I'm meeting with, I'll just not say that I'm going to the weird meeting that I don't want anyone to know. You know? But um, what happened was they actually turned that on. It was retro active and that caused lots of problems. So I do think that whenever you, you do sometimes want to make changes in privacy settings because you really can't predict um, the value of the open data unless you do that. And at some point a company might or an, an organization might decide they, or they might want to change those defaults. But how you let people know what those changes are and I think how you 
deal with past data. You know, some of those things we've learned a lot, and there are people doing research in this space, but I just think it's pretty new. Um, you know, like at Facebook, every other moment th that changes, like what the settings are, and it's sometimes hard to actually be tracking the long-term implications of that over time. I mean, I don't think we know the long-term implication because, you know, our kids haven't grown up. I think it will be, yeah, I was actually just for the virtual world stuff, I was trying to find it on the web and I was like, it's not there. Oh yeah, that's before, before we did that. You know, I really wanted to find these awesome pictures. I can only find it in Wikipedia. And I was like, where is that PowerPoint presentation that I have somewhere? So there's, you know, it's just amazing what we take for granted, I think. And I don't know that we will. I, I think that anybody who said they knew, I wouldn't believe them really. I mean, I think we're gonna have to just be vigilant and on this space and thinking about it and just in there as it evolves to try to design tools um, and try them out. Thank you. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> that's a wonderful talk. I wanted to ask you uh, if you could speak about reflection because I think you sh showed many interfaces that presented data mm -hmm. but doesn't yet allow us to actually reflect on our relationship with this person. So for example, in the Outlook Social Connector, you have pointwise information about, okay, X did you know, a, a certain thing on a certain day, but I want to be able to reflect on my relationship with this person or reflect on the relationship between me and a group that this person belongs to. So have you considered uh, maybe um, not having information visualization necessarily, but maybe more subtle reflection mechanisms that are much more common in the arts? I mean, I would love to see more of this. I feel like all of these UIs, in a sense, are just like a starting point, right? But um, one thing that we have thought about is how you represent use of time. How are you spending your time? And can you kind of summarize that for people a little bit? Because I think if you actually knew how much time you spent in certain apps or how much time you spent responding to that annoying email, um, you might not actually, often I think people spend time reacting because email, Facebook, Twitter, they're all like these feeds that are interrupting you every minute with someone else's thought or agenda or thing that they want you to do. And you're not as intentional maybe as you want to be about, did I actually get done today the thing that I came here to do or did I just do what everybody else in my inbox or my Twitter feed wanted me to go view or see? And I, I think that this is going to be an issue for people, time management, um, blocking time, making sure I can actually have get my stuff done and be intentional about what I really wanted to do. Um, you hear all the time of people saying, well, I'm going to go like back to my hotel room just to like get work done, you know, and, and we're older and we're used to that, but how is that going to impact, you know, younger people? One thing that we do see from the personal map is sometimes when people see it, they're like, oh my God, I'm so depressed. I don't like any of those people, <laughs> you know? And so I think it's just a great reflection. Wow, those are the people you're talking to the most. Well. Go spend time with the people that make you the great you that you want to be, you know? So I do think that reflection tools, especially maybe summaries of how you're spending your time, who you're spending your time with, where is your attention, and then what did you think it was and what do you want it to be would just be great, really cool tools to look at. Yeah, I mean, my question was, did you try introducing that in your... Uh, um, we have done the time ones. Um, Eric Corvitz has, has also done some work in this space. Uh, I mean, we've done some, but we probably haven't done that much really around individuals. We've done more at the overview level. But I think you're right on. I'd love to see stuff like that. Hi, Lily. Um, so it was really interesting that you talked about how the groups, uh, you know, that uh, it's very difficult for people to configure the groups because the groups are so dynamic. What are your views about the Google Plus circles? Uh, is that uh, a way for people to configure the groups? Do you think that actually can help with the privacy. I, I guess that was the, uh, that seems to be the motivation behind the circles as the first class citizen. I mean, I think adding some lightweight way for people to know who they're talking to, uh, you know, imagine that, um, is a great thing. Um, you can do that in Facebook, but it's just, and it's been there forever, but people don't do it because it's not as easy as it could be, and it's not hard but it's just not as easy as it could be. And so I actually think that if you could, you know, maybe seed some of those groups and then implicitly learn who's part of them and adjust those over time, that would be great. Or kind of mine your information and give you sets of people and let you every once in a while tweak them. Because these slides are kind of old. And I was looking at them and I was like, all my groups are completely different now, you know? And they literally change every time you change projects, change a job, you know, go to a different group, get new people that you talk to, run a conference. And you're just, I just don't think that people are going to organize that 
for themselves. Like one thing that I think with those groups is I'm the only person that can see those groups. So groups are more interesting if other people can also see them and use them. So even things like the Facebook groups, you know, at least you, like if, if you're in my group and Bill's in my group and Andy's in my group, but Andy has a group that's you and Bill, I don't, I don't know. So my group isn't very useful, and maybe you're the type of person that doesn't bother creating groups, and you can't use it either. So I think how you share and let other people access these groups um, will kind of determine whether or not they're successful. Because um, I personally, like in my groups on Google+, Plus, I have like a giant friends group, <laughs> which is basically like my Facebook friends, and because um, I'm kind of lazy. And then I have like really, really friends, something like that. But um, I, I think we need to help people. And you know, maybe if you have 20 friends, you can organize them, or 100. But if you've got, if it's all the people that you interact with, um, I just don't think people are going to do that over time and maintain them. Other questions? Social. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I'm um, at Lilich if you're on Twitter, and I'm on all the social networks. And I also have email, Lilich at Microsoft.com. So um, if you think of things or have thoughts or ideas or questions, let me know. Thank you. There, I'm connected. We have some uh, housekeeping details to take care of right now. Um, one of the things that we have is actually a box lunch for people. And now it's a box lunch for some of you, but not for others. Uh, uh, in particular, if you are a part of the what we call the LATAM or the EMEA group, uh, you're having another meeting over in Building 99. And so you should not bother to pick up a box lunch because you get a nice hot meal in Building 99. Uh, but for the rest of you, uh, you're welcome to pick up a, uh, uh, a box lunch in the, uh, over in the Hood Baker area. Uh, buses are available to get you back to the Bellevue Hilton. And so you should go ahead and you can, you can take the bus back and take your box lunch with you. Um, and then also, uh, again, for the people, uh, the, if those of you that need to get to the airport or something like that, uh, uh, the conference uh, center desk uh, around in the front there, uh, they can get taxi cabs for you. Uh, again, for the LATAM and the EMEA groups, uh, you should go get on the bus now to Building 99 uh, for this afternoon's meeting. Uh, and so don't bother with the box lunch because you'll get a good one. Um, uh, the box lunches are also good. So. <laughs> now, there's also information about the bus. We, we, we've arranged, since some of you are just basically stuck here and can't get out until tomorrow morning, uh, that you might want to go hang around in downtown Seattle. Uh, and, and so we've got a bus uh, that's, that's available. It departs at, uh, from, the, from the Hilton at 2 p.m. And it gets to our famous Pike Place Market, which is actually a really historic fun place to prowl around uh, in downtown Seattle. And there's other things very nearby. The Seattle Art Museum is very nearby, and the Sculpture Park, and things like that. Uh, and so if you take the bus down there, they'll pick you up at uh, 7 PM, again, back at the market. Uh, so if you want to do that, you need to stop at the registration desk to sign up. Um, uh, Judith, did I miss anything on that? Nope. Nope, we're covered. OK, I've got one last comment, and that is uh, obviously the thank yous. Uh, it's a great pleasure to come to the end of this wonderful faculty summit. Uh, we've had so many comments about how people have enjoyed it, but of course, you wouldn't have been able to enjoy it without the uh, organization and the vision that's gone into this. And so I want to make two particular thank yous right now. The first one is, of course, to Tony Hay, without whom none of this would happen because it all happens from the top. And so thank you very much, Tony, for making this. Uh, <laughs> 
and from uh, our fantastic event staff. You've been in contact with all of them at the desks, up and down the corridors, helping you all the time. I'm not going to call out their names because actually there are 53 of them. And <laughs> that would take us way past when uh, the sell-by date of the box lunch. So, uh, <laughs> but if you do pop uh, past them and see them, do thank them again. They've got the black back badges. And we certainly, from our side, thank them most sincerely for everything they've done to make this a long haul and a very happy and successful one. And we wish you all a happy trip back to your uh, homes. And remember that the website for the Faculty Summit will be constantly updating over the next week or so. And all the talks here will be available online. You can recommend them to your friends, your uh, colleagues and your students to see the ones that you missed or the ones you particularly liked. You'll be able to see them again online. So thank you for coming. Bon voyage and see you hopefully again. Oh, Bye. What? Oh. <laughs> Dennis. One more thing. We, 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 uh, we would greatly value feedback uh, on, on, the, on the conference itself, the summit, and in particular on what sort of things you would like to see in the future. And maybe more of this, less of that. Uh, we would be very, very interested in that. Okay, don't, don't worry, you'll get a survey. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks.